last week, but we'll go back to the book of Romans again, chapter number two. Thank you for Brother Junior for filling in for me. He already told on that. <laughs> <laughs> you probably could do a better job than me. <laughs> Romans 2, we're going to we'll look at verses 17 through 20. Here in this text, Paul turns his attention to the Jews. Verse 17, he says, Behold, thou art called a Jew, and restest in the law, and makest thy boast of God, and knowest his will, and provest the things that are more excellent, and being instructed out of the law, and art confident that thou thyself art a guide of the blind, a, a light of them which are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, which has to form knowledge and of the truth in the law. Amen. Here, said Paul, turns his attention to the Jews, which from a contextual standpoint seems a little interesting because if, if you can recall back when we were looking at the life of Paul, he, he wrote this letter when he was in Corinth and he had, and the Jews had been expelled from Rome at that time. Right. You recall that Claudius expelled the Jews, that's why Aquila and Priscilla were in Corinth when he went there. Right. That's Acts chapter 18, if you want to look that up sometime. But apparently there were still some Jews there, or they had returned by the, this point. But there was a fairly large number of Jews originally in Rome. They had their own little community in Rome. But here he says, we hold our called a Jew. And one thing I think we sometimes forget, we apply the label of Jew to all of the all the tribes of Israel, but really it refers specifically to the southern kingdom, mm -hmm. to those who were of the tribe of Judah. And of course Benjamin became part of that as well, and the other ten tribes were scattered throughout the earth. Right. And we'll be gathered again at the last day. Mm -hmm. But the Jews were the nation of Israel during this time, during the time of Christ. He said, Behold, thou art called a Jew, and resteth in the law. Mm -hmm. As they took their, their rest, if you will, in the law, they trusted in that they had the law. Right. So from here on in our text, and really throughout the end of the chapter, he deals with the Jews and what they were trusting in. He begins by listing all these things that they thought they were, and then he shows them that they weren't really all that they thought they were. Right. He says they rest in the law as they, they took assurance that they had the law, that they were keeping the law. They were very self-righteous about keeping the law. They trusted in circumcision. and the, If you recall during the ministry of Christ, they oftentimes said, well, yeah, Abraham was our father. They, they trusted in those things rather than in Christ. So if you know much about the law, it's not much to rest upon because the law requires work. The law requires perfect obedience. And if you don't keep that, it requires death and sacrifice. Exactly. It doesn't seem like there's a whole lot of whole lot to rest in there. I would always be troubled that I wasn't keeping the law perfectly, that I hadn't done the sacrifice quite right. Right. Let's go over to Matthew for just a moment. Matthew chapter eleven. Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. Our rest should be in Christ, not in the law or in works. Amen. Verse 28. Christ says, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. When there was a dispute about keeping the law or in the new covenant or not keeping the law, and Paul and Peter had a dispute about it, and well as the church is there. And the conclusion was to not to place a yoke that neither ye nor your fathers could bear, speaking to the law, on the new believers. The law was as this 
heavy burdens, great work of labor. And then Christ says, Come unto me, and I will give you rest. Verse 29, Take my yoke upon me, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Amen. I don't think we should just ignore the law, but the law was a great burden for believers, and yet Christ fulfilled the law on our behalf. <coughs> our rest should not be in what we are doing, but what in Christ has done for us. Right. So we should not trust in the law or good works or any other thing, but we should simply trust in Christ. Going back to our text in Romans, he goes on to say from that they rest in the law, and he said, Make us thy boast of God. Well, they were the Jews were a very proud people, weren't they? Especially the Pharisees. They were very proud of their external knowledge of God, but they oftentimes <coughs> lacked an internal knowledge of God. Well, they, they knew about God, they knew about his law, they studied it regularly, but yet they didn't have a real relationship with him, if I could say it that way. They didn't truly understand God and who he was. You know, Abraham it was said he is the friend of God. Yet of you know, the Pharisees, he called them a den of vipers, hypocrites, right? A wicked generation. That's the problem with many today. They have this head knowledge of God, but they don't truly know who God is. Really. Right. Well, you can go to seminary and theology schools, and that's not necessarily wrong if they're teaching the truth, but that alone will not draw you closer to God. Amen. That alone will not save you. Just growing up in a good church and knowing all the things to say and knowing all the right doctrines in and of itself will not save one. Amen. But the Jews, that's what they boasted about. That's what they were really proud about. They knew the law in and out. And they, they, they were the people of God. Mm. And that was, they were very self-righteous and proud about that. Right. They were, as they said there, they were boasting about it. They were, really our boast should only be in Christ and the cross. Turn to Galatians for just a moment. Galatians chapter 6. You'll have to turn here, but also over in Luke chapter 18, um, we see the perfect example of those type of people. You have the Pharisee and the publican that went up to pray. When the Pharisees say, God, I thank you that I'm not as other men are. Right. Adulterer, extortioner, a tithe, of all I possess. In fact, he thinks that tithe twice in a week of all I possess. For you fast, you say you fast twice in a week and tithe of all you possess. I'm not as, as this publican is. That's how the Jews were, though. Especially the Pharisees, and I'm afraid that's how many Christians are today. They're, God, I thank thee that I'm not. It was that Christian over there. I know better than that. I'm not better than them. Well, I'm the member of a good Baptist church, so I'm better than those other believers over there. There you go. Hmm. If we have a right understanding of God and a right understanding of who we are, we wouldn't be boastful about anything about ourselves. Amen. Galatians chapter 6, verses 12 through 14. Here, Paul is, if you know, familiar, familiar with the Galatian letter, they were had some that were trying to teach them to go back underneath the law and to keep the law. And he comes to this conclusion here at the end of the book, verse 12, he says, As many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. Mm -hmm. he's, he's telling them these here that, they really didn't care about their souls. They just wanted to make a show in the flesh, he says. They wanted to show off and say, yeah, I'm circumcised. Yeah, these here are circumcised. Yeah, they're better than you others because they keep this commandment. And he said also, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. And they were 
afraid of what others might say or what others might do. If our service for God is affected by what the world thinks, then we must not be serving Him effectively. Right. If we're persuaded to do or not do something that God commands because of, well, they might think I'm a little different or I'm weird, then we're not serving God wholeheartedly. Right. Going on to verse 13, he says, For neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law, but desire to have you circumcised, they may glory in your flesh. Again, he says the same thing. They, they're not actually worried about your souls or about you serving God. They're, right. Just want to, something to boast and brag about. Verse 14, he says, But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world was crucified, and me and I am to the world. Amen. So the child of God, that's all we have to, to boast about is what Christ has done. Amen. And I've said it before, and I probably will say it many more times, it shouldn't be look at me and look what I've done. It should be look at Christ and what he has done for me. Mm-hmm. Any good that we can do is because of Christ. Any blessings that we receive are because of Christ. Any anything worth boasting about is because of Christ. The fact that we have the ability to serve Him, the ability to do good works, that comes from God. We should praise and glorify Him for that. Not say, "Look at me and look what I did." If God has kept us from certain sins or has kept us in the way of righteousness, then that we should say thank God for that. Not look at me and look at what I am doing. Amen. I am again reminded the words of Paul to the Corinthians, by the grace of God I am what I am. Mm-hmm. It's, whether you're the, the great faithful pastor of one of the Lord's churches or whether you're just the average church member. The fact that you're not still lost in sin is simply because the grace of God was applied to your life. And like the one brother said when he saw the criminal being led to execution, he said, but for the grace of God, there go I. There you go. We would be just as wicked or more so if it wasn't for the grace of God. So, Therefore, we have really nothing to boast about in and of ourselves. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Let's go back to our text and go on to verse 18. Romans 2, 18. He says, And knowest his will. Continuing on what the Jews really trust in and what they say about themselves, that they know the will of God. Um, they knew his will not in the sense of, you know, for our individual lives or certain events that we seek to know his will, but they knew his will as it pertains to the law. Mm-hmm. The law was told you to do this, or told you don't do that. There wasn't a whole lot of gray area. But in that sense, they knew the will of God. They, thou shalt not commit adultery. That was pretty plain. And thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Honor thy father and thy mother. Those things are very clear. And they knew exactly what the will of God is in that sense. Mm-hmm. Yet, just knowing those things still aren't enough to save one. Amen. Well, I think it's good to have Ten Commandments in the courthouse and such like that. And I am against them taking them out. But the natural man left to himself, those Ten Commandments aren't going to do him a whole lot of good. Right. If you've never been truly born again, that's what will make the difference. It's good to keep the commandments. It's good to live a good moral upstanding life but separate and apart from Christ those things ultimately won't matter in the end Amen that's what the Jews got wrong they thought the commandments would save them they thought the law would save them mm-hmm. the law could not save them mm-hmm. and he says they know and know it's his will and going on it says and approves the things that are more excellent and it seems to mean the they were able to test or to prove, as it says here, whether things were right or wrong because they had the law. Mm-hmm. So they had that God standard which would judge things against and say, yes, this is the way it should be. Or, no, that's not what we should do. 
that we have his word today to do the same thing, but again, because we can judge right from wrong doesn't isn't necessarily going to save us. Mm -hmm. We should strive to live a godly, soberly, and righteously in this present world. That's what Titus teaches us, but that in and of itself, being a, a good person is not going to save you. And he goes on to say they're being instructed out of the law. That is, the Jews, they have the law to instruct them in the ways of righteousness. They, they were committed to the oracles of God, it says in chapter 3 here of Romans. And they had whole groups of Jews that were dedicated their whole lives to studying the law. The Pharisees, for example, the Sadducees. You had the, the priesthood who committed their lives to the service of the temple. And yet, even though they had the law, even though they were instructed out of it, they still didn't truly know who God was. Christ literally came to them, God in the flesh, and yet they rejected him. Right. And it was the very ones who were supposed to know the law in and out, the ones who were supposed to be the, the religious elite of their day, and yet they say, crucify him, crucify him. Mm-hmm. It's good to know the Word of God. It's good to even memorize it. It's good to be studied on doctrines and to know truth from heresy, but yet those things in and of themselves cannot save you. Right. Those things in and of themselves will not bring you to a right knowledge of God, if I can say it that way. It will not bring you to a truly knowing who God is. Right. But there's a lot of people who had right doctrines in history and yet they were terrible people. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of people who who knew about the Word of God and yet they well, no doubt didn't truly know who God was. Right. And yet the Jews were the same way. They, Especially the Pharisees, they knew the law in and out. They, and Paul talks about himself. He brags that you know, in the flesh he could boast that he was a Pharisee, you know, of the stock of the tribe of Benjamin. He had lots in the flesh to boast about. But yet, and all those things, even in his great zeal that he thought he had for God, he didn't truly know God until God came and revealed himself to him on that road to Damascus. Right. Amen. Let's go back to our text here in verse number 19. He goes on to say, And art confident that thou art a guide of the blind. They were very confident that they were leading the blind, yet they couldn't see that they themselves were blind. John, let's go to Matthew, a couple places here. Matthew chapter 15, probably a familiar passage. Matthew 15 and verse number 12. We'll read through verse number 14. It says, And his disciples came and took up the oops, excuse, wrong chapter. Chapter 14. Chapter 15, verse number 12. It says, Then came his disciples and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Pharisees were offended after they heard the saying? That was after Christ told them it's not what goes into the mouth, but it's what comes out of the files of man. Amen. Verse 13, he says, And he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. That's speaking of the wheat versus the tares, for example. Mm -hmm. Verse 14, he says, Let them alone. They, they be blind, leaders of the blind, and if the blind Lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. Right. I think we know that literally the blind can't lead the blind, but spiritually the blind can't lead the blind either. Right. A lost person cannot truly guide one to know the scriptures and know the God. And what will happen is they'll eventually fall into the ditch spiritually. Yeah. It will both go by the wayside, spiritually speaking. 
Mm-hmm. We turn to chapter 23, Matt, or Christ expounds even further on this. We'll read several verses here. Matthew 23, verses 15 through 28. He rebukes the Pharisees quite harshly in this whole chapter. But beginning in verse number 15, he says, What would you scribe and Pharisees, hypocrites? For ye can pass sea and land to make one cross light when he is made, ye make him twofold, twofold more of the child of hell than yourselves. Amen. That's the blind leading the blind. But the lost are not going to lead someone closer to God. But someone who is already trusting in their selves, trusting in their works, and was self-righteous, they're not going to lead you closer to God. Right. Verse, four, or verse 16, he says, Woe unto you, you blind guide, which say, Whosoever shall swear by the temple, it is nothing, but whosoever shall swear by the gold of the temple, he is a debtor, he fools and blind, for whether it is greater the gold or the temple that sanctifies the gold. Amen. The Jews, and especially the Pharisees, had their priorities out of line. You're right. See, we'll go on to say in verse 18, And whosoever shall swear by the altar is nothing, but whosoever sweareth by the gift as upon it, he is guilty. He fools and blind, for whether it is greater the gift or the altar that sanctifieth the gift. Who? Whoso therefore shall swear by the altar, sweareth by it, and by all things thereon. And whoso shall swear by the temple, sweareth by it, and by him that dwelleth therein. Amen. It was God that was supposed to dwell in the temple. In verse 22, it says, And he that shall swear by the heaven, sweareth by the throne of God, and him that sitteth on thereon. Verse 23, he goes on to say, Woe unto ye, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe, but mention, a nice and human, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These things ye ought to have done, and not to let the other undone. Amen. The Pharisees had their importance placed on the wrong things. That's it. And then when it came to the law, they, they did these good things, but yet they left out, as he says here, the weightier matters of the law, things that were more issues of the heart rather than outward appearances. Well, they left off judgment, mercy, and faith. And he says, you ought to have done these, but also not to let the other undone. Right. I'm afraid in our day and age, most people dwell on one or two extremes. Mm -hmm. They're either like the Pharisees here, and putting on a good outward show and doing all the right things outwardly, but nothing inwardly. And the other people are they focus so much on the quote inward things that they forget about the outward. Right. Well, God doesn't care if you do that or that as long as your heart's right. Well, it's not what God says in His Word. Amen. Yet we ought to do both and not leave one or the other undone. Mm -hmm. Verse 24, he says, Ye blind guys would strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. Mm -hmm. See, so they. They were so focused on the tiniest of detail, they missed the big picture. Verse 25 says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you make clean the outside of the cup and the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Thou blind Pharisees, cleanse first that which is within the cup and the platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. You bet. I don't know about you, if I'm going to get a cup to drink something out of, I'm going to be more worried about clean the inside and the outside. I'd like the whole thing to be clean. Amen. Um, the Pharisees, they were like, if you just wash the outside, and worry about what was in. Verse 27, he goes on to say, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye are like unto white sepulchers, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrites hypocrisy and iniquity. And I'm afraid many, many today are just like this, though, aren't they? Mm -hmm. So they're putting on this outward show of righteousness, but inwardly they are still full of wickedness and iniquity. Right. As he calls them here, they're as white as sepulchers, and they're very beautiful to look upon. They were very 
pretty on the outside, but yet they were full of corruption, they were full of dead men's bones and rotted flesh on the inside. I don't know about you, but I have no desire to dwell on the, uh, the tombs. Right. Yet so that is exactly the, the spiritual nature of all those who are self-righteous, all those who put on a show rather than are right in heart. I'm afraid if we're not careful, we will do the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. Let's go back to our text and we'll try to get closed up here soon. It says, next after they were blind, the guy said, the light of them which are in darkness. We're told to be light to those in darkness, Matthew 5, verse 14 through 16. Amen. And ye are the light of the world, Christ says to his church. And the old man light the bush, or light the candle and stick them under a bushel. You are a city set on a hill which cannot be hid. And he goes on to say, Let your light so shine before men they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. The whole world is in darkness, and we as his people are to be a light to them. But yet the, the Jews, these Jews here, they, they were in darkness themselves, and yet they were trying to be a light to those in darkness. Mm -hmm. Those who trust in the law or in their own good works, those who were self-righteous, they were still in darkness themselves. Mm -hmm. Christ is the light which lighteth all men, he says. Amen. And without Christ, you can't be a light. Without Christ, you have no light in of yourselves. In fact, in another place, Christ says that your whole light is darkness if you're evil. If you don't know Christ as Savior, then you can't be in the light as he is in the light. Right. Let's go to verse 20 and we'll close here. It's going on, meaning they say that they are an instructor of the foolish. That is a Training correct those that are unlearned, unbelieving. But they instruct those who don't know the ways of God. We saw that over there in Matthew that they they were good about proselyting others or bringing them to the Jewish faith. But the problem is they, they said they made themselves or they made the new ones twofold more the child of hell. Right. So they didn't instruct them correctly. Mm -hmm. We, as the church, are to be instructors of the foolish, though, aren't we? In the same sense that we are to go in all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, or as Matthew says, to, to go preach to all nations, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I command you. It is the job of God's people, and specifically the church today, to be an instructor of the foolish or to be one who spreads the truth, one who teaches and corrects one who is a teacher and a babe as they say next year you know the Jews they rather than being a good instructor they chose their traditions and their right their own selves over the command of God I turn their remarks to so Mark chapter 7 verse 9 he says full well rejected the commandments of God by your own tradition mm -hmm. now, if they would rather keep their own tradition that sounds a lot like the Catholic Church than to right. teach the word of God and then he says next that they would call themselves teachers of babes that's the one who teaches those who are young or immature in the faith Turn over to Matt first, the Hebrews and then the Ephesians. Quick Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12 through 14. <clears throat> I would like to say that all babies are new believers in Christ, but according to this text, it doesn't necessarily make it so. Verse 12 says, For when 
For when for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need of one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. The strong meat belongs to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Amen. And those who aren't mature in the word, they're described as babes. And those needing they need spiritual milk rather than spiritual means. And yet we as the people of God are to be teachers of the babes, aren't we? We're to instruct new believers or those who have them matured in the faith and teach them the truths of the word of God. Amen. Just anyone who has dealt with babies knows you can't fill the state down a newborn's mouth. Mm -hmm. you, can't. you have to start them off with milk with the easy things. He says here they are unskillful in the word. Right. You know, we ought not to stay as babies. We ought not to stay on the milk, but rather we should grow and desire the meat of the Word of God. But to be a correct teacher of babes, you have to know how to teach a babe. Mm -hmm. well, using fancy words and systematic teaching doesn't necessarily work too well for someone who's immature in the faith. Right. Amen. Like I said, I know me and Brother Larry know some of those terms, but I don't think you don't use them very often. So just you know, Christology and Soteriology and Eschatology and all those things. But you go out and talk to the average believer today, and they probably couldn't tell you what those things mean. Right. Amen. It wouldn't do me very good to get up here and start teaching on those things using big words that no one else understands. That's it. Amen. To be a, a teacher of babies. You have to teach them correctly because they don't know how to teach themselves. So anyone who has raised children knows you have to guide them and be gentle with them. Sometimes you have to be firm with them as well. But you can't teach, I can't treat a little one like I would treat little Larry. Or like I would treat Andrew and smack him around. <laughs> the story of Ephesians, I mean, Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter number 4, verse number 11 through verse 14. He says, speaking of the church, and he says, He gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. And here we have pastors and teachers. We don't have any prophets that I know of or apostles. Verse 12, he says, For the preacher perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Can you imagine? This is the reason why he gave first apostles, then prophets, and evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. Verse 13, he says, Till we all come in unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God and the perfect man, under the measure of stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with Every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they will lie and wait to deceive. Amen. The pastors and teachers and are supposed to instruct, as he said, in the way of righteousness to bring us more in unity with Christ, with one another. That we be no more, he says, children tossed to and fro. Those who are unlearned in the word. Those who are babes are will be easily tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. Everything that sounds good will go that way and this way. Mm -hmm. But a good pastor and teachers will teach us the truth of the Word of God. Yeah, I, I see many today that are, they do go after everything that sounds good, don't they? Right. I know one person who he started as this denomination, and he went to another one, then another one, another one. Now he's some sort of orthodox. 
That's why it's important to go from being a babe and be rooted and grounded in Christ. Amen. And that's the work that he gave first and foremost as pastors and teachers and to teach the flock, to preach the truth, to spread the truth to the world. And certainly we are individually responsible for learning as well. But to start out, you were like the uh, Ethiopian Union. How can I learn except someone to show me? Right. We need to be teachers of babes. The world and the devil will teach them contrary to the word of God. Amen. Uh, let's go back to our text and we'll close here. Romans 2, verse number 20. We went over the very time a little bit today. <laughs> But I want to cover all these verses in one setting because they've you know, picked back one off another <clears> here. <throat> it says, An instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, which has the form of knowledge and of the truth in the law. Right. They, they have some form of knowledge, they didn't have the right understanding of the truth. In our day and age, we have even more. Revelation of truth than they did under the law. They had the law and they understood the law and the truth that was available to them in that. We have the entire word of God available to us. And even so here in America, we can go down the dollar store and buy a copy for cheap or you can download it free on your phone. I've got two copies on my phone. I have right. Probably 10 Bibles packed away somewhere. We have the truth available to us. Right. It's our own combination if we don't have a right understanding of it. But without the Holy Spirit, we can't have a right understanding of it. Amen. This is comfort which I shall send. He shall guide you in all truth. Many today have a form, as it says here, of knowledge of the truth. They know about the Bible. They know a little bit about God. They they don't have a right understanding of God and the Bible. You can just go to your average church today and you can see that they don't truly understand who Jehovah is. Right. Second Timothy 3 5, Paul warns against the same type of thing. He says, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof from such turn away. Amen. So many today profess to know about God, know about the scriptures, but their own teachings, their own testimonies show that they know nothing of God. Right. Let us be instructors of righteousness. Let us be teachers of faith. Let us ever be proclaiming the truth of the Word of God and have our light so shine before men that they may see their way to Christ. Because the blind, they certainly can't lead the blind to Christ. Right. Those in darkness won't lead them to Christ. Certainly, the world and the devil is not going to teach the truth of the Word of God. So we'll close with that thought. Lord willing. Next week, we'll pick up from there. And the Jews trusted that they did all these things, and Paul showed them that they weren't really all they thought they were. Amen.